Howdy folks, what's going on? Today we've got a fun thing we're going to work with. We've got an Xbox wireless controller. We're going to plug it into Touch Designer and use it to control a 3D camera. Because we all know sometimes using the 3D cameras in Touch Designer or really any application with just your mouse and keyboard can feel unintuitive, clunky, and especially for clients, you know, they really don't want to get their hands dirty with keyboard and mouse, where this can be something a little bit more fun that they can play with. So the first thing we're going to do really quickly is just set up the most basic 3D scene we can. So I'm going to create a geometry comp, a camera, which is going to be what we're going to control. I'm going to make a light comp. And then I'm going to create a render top just so that I can see that on my screen. Now we have our 3D scene. I'm going to display this as my background. And what I'm going to use for getting access to the data from my Xbox controller here is the joystick chop. And if you've never used the joystick chop, it's really main function is to get data from things like this, whether it's the Xbox controller, any kind of Logitech joystick. So not even joysticks in this form factor, but maybe sticks, steering wheels, all of these types of things should be able to communicate relatively easily with the joystick chop. Now, in this case, I just have this connected straight to my PC over Bluetooth. Nothing fancy there. Just went ahead and paired it with my computer inside of the Bluetooth settings. We can see it here, Xbox wireless controller connected. So no fancy funny business and middleware or anything like that. Now, once I bring in this joystick chop, you'll see that sometimes if the joystick sources at the default, you'll automatically start to get all these different values driven out. Other times, if you don't, you might just need to change this to either player one controller, or if alternatively you see uh, another input appear, you might want to use that. So in this case, we're going to set it back to default. And what you can see already is that I'm getting a lot of different kinds of channels. So we can see for the buttons, those make sense. I get a, a zero to one channel every time I click any of the buttons. And you can see for the sticks, what happens is, for example, on this X axis, if I move my joystick to the left, I get a number between zero and negative one based on how far away I am from the center. And if I move it to the right, I get a number from zero to one based on how far it is from the center. Now that's great, but it's not really something that you can immediately just drag and drop that channel right onto a camera comp. We have to process it a little bit. Now luckily the processing we're gonna do is actually very simple and it's a super useful technique that you can use with a lot of different inputs, not even just controllers. It's helpful for mice, keyboards, if you're using Kinect or Leap Motions, for all these kind of controls, it's a, it's a useful trick you can use. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is first start with a select chop. And I'm going to select out this X axis channel here. Oh, and it looks like my Bluetooth got disconnected and we're back live. So I got my X axis pulled out here. And what I'm going to do is actually use a speed chop to accumulate or reduce a value based on whether this is positive or negative. And that's a really cool functionality of the speed chop that most people don't use because you may have used the speed chop before or seen examples where people say, well, you know, if you plug a constant into a speed chop and you do something like send in a value of one, all of a sudden you're counting one every second. If you send in a value of 10, the speed chop's gonna increment by 10 units every second. And you might have even seen the trick before where if you set it to 30, this essentially acts now as a 30 FPS counter because it is counting up 30 numbers every second. Similarly, if you set the 60, you can now almost imagine this is a 60 FPS counter. Now that's useful if you want to count FPS, but in this case, we want to take advantage of something the speed chop can do, which is actually ramp down the value as well. So even just using a constant, you can see if I start to move my value into the positive, it starts to count my number up. But inversely, if I move it into the negative, it's going to start to count that number back down. And that's going to be perfect because we're not really going to have an, you know, limited amount of range in 3D space. So really what we just want to do is that if our stick goes to the left or right, we're essentially just continuously moving our camera left or right. So this is great because we can just plug our select right into the speed chop. And you're immediately going to see what we're talking about. Now, as I'm holding on the right stick here or the right side of the left stick, I'm just continuously accumulating a value as if I'm just moving through 3D space. 
And if I go back to the left, it starts to decrease that value and bring me back along that path. Now from here, it's pretty easy because even with that, we could just go ahead and drop a null chop here. And on my camera for my translate X, I'm gonna reference this new channel. And we can see the torus immediately disappeared because I was already at a value of five on my X axis. So let me just hold this. And as we start to get back to the middle, we're gonna see we're panning across our geometry here. Now, if this is also really slow and you say, hey, you know what, I actually I need this to move a little bit faster, it's really easy to scale these values. And usually what I'll recommend is you scale the inputs of your speed chop. Because you could put a scale afterwards, but I find putting it before and actually scaling the incoming value is a better option here. So I'm gonna add a math chop right before the speed chop. And I'm just gonna say, hey, you know what? Multiply this number by four. So now it's going to be four times as fast and responsive as it was before. I could say 10, and it's now 10 times more sensitive. And you'll have to dial this in based on your use case. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this maybe back down to three. Three seemed to be like a good amount here. Now the nice thing about this workflow that we've created is that it's, it's very generic. It doesn't specifically only work on the X axis. There's nothing about this that's unique to the stick controller. So if I wanted to do this with the up and down on the Y axis, I'll go ahead and make another select, delete the X axis channel, add my Y axis. Now a nice trick you can do here is many people when you're just starting out with touch designer, you might get into this kind of train of thought of as you're thinking in your head what you need to build, you create new operators. So a common temptation might be to do something like just grab all these operators and start copying and pasting them and then put another null at the end here, reference that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but as you start to develop more of your skills, a good trick that I always recommend is see what operators you have available and see which ones you can just reuse with more and more data. So maybe a good example of this would be that I probably will want to scale my Y axis the same way I'm scaling my X axis. So maybe I can just add it to the already existing math chop. And what you'll see is the cool thing about speed chop is that it can also handle more channels. So now all of a sudden I have both my X and Y axis of my joystick here going through that same uh, processing. So now I can go to the end null here, grab my Y axis channel and reference it on the Y of the camera. Now what we're also gonna notice is that as I'm playing with this a lot, I'm, I'm often outside of the camera bounds here. So I wanna find a way to quickly just reset this speed. Now the nice thing is I could come over here and click on one of these pulse parameters to reset it. And you can see moving my joystick around does all the things we want it to do. But what if I wanna use one of these buttons, like maybe the B button? So what I can do is go over back to my joystick chop, take a look when I hit the B button, I can see that channel B2 is lighting up. So again, I'll grab another select chop. I'm gonna select that B2 channel. And I could do something really simple, like actually connect it to the second input of the speed, which if I hover over, you can see it says input one reset. So now anytime I hit the B button, it zeroes out my channels again. Now something you're gonna notice about my controller here is because it's not a very good controller, it's that when I release the stick too quickly, it doesn't actually zero out my value there. So that's something just to be aware of with whatever controller you're using, make sure it does actually zero out those values somehow. Now in this case, whatever I end up doing with that view, I know that I can always hit B and jump right back to my home situation here. So that's great. So now I've got my one stick hooked up and it's doing a nice panning around here and I got my reset button, but what about my other stick here? What if I wanted to control the rotation of the camera with this one? Well, luckily for us, it's a lot of the same process. So I can go ahead and select my X rotation here, which is gonna give me the second stick X axis. And in this case, I probably will wanna have a different scaling factor than I did before for my other stick. So I'm gonna make a new math chop because I know the rotation, you know, whereas my translation could be 
a big move going across, you know, negative five to positive five, my rotation, I know it's going to have to be a bigger number because rotating around is a 360 degree operation. So I'm going to need a bigger value range. But the nice thing is speed, as we saw before, can accept lots of different channels. So what I could do to save having to make yet another speed chop is actually add a merge chop in between my math and speed. And then I can start adding more and more channels to that list. So what I'm going to do is go to this first math chop, right click on the output, add a merge chop, and I'm going to take my X rotation and add that to the merge. So now we're going to see all three of these channels end up in the merge. They're all going to the same speed. And then from there, I have one null chop that I can use to reference, which is great. That's, that's how you want it to be. So let's even just start with this before we start scaling our X rotation. So I'm going to find my X rotation. And this is a common mistake people make because they think the channel named X rotation is actually going to correlate to rotating on the X axis, which it won't. Because even if we go to our rotation channel here on the X and I just try and rotate it manually, you can see that rotating along the X is actually equivalent to what would traditionally be the up and down of the second stick. And what we want to do when we rotate on the X, you know, with the X rotation of the stick is actually change our Y, which is going to rotate us along the Y. You know, if you think about the Y axis and rotating around it, that's kind of what we want to do with that stick. So it's always something to be careful of, especially with different controllers. So in this case, our X rotation channel is going to the Y. And then if I even go ahead and select out my last and final channel here, which is going to be my Y rotation, I'm going to go ahead and add that to the math that I made that's going to deal with my rotation channels. It's automatically going to get merged, automatically going to get put on the speed. And therefore, I can now take that and put that on my Y axis. So now if I go ahead and reset back to my origin position, my left stick is working. And my way, you know, the second stick maybe is working, but it's too hard to tell because, you know, the values are moving so slowly. So I'm just going to go back to my math and maybe on the multi add do this by 20. So now we can see definitely it's doing more stuff. A little bit hard to control. Oh, here we go. Now I'm getting the hang of it. And what you'll find is this can be incredibly useful if you're doing any kind of previs or if you're doing any kind of maybe animation that you want to record for a camera inside of a scene. All of these things are honestly so much easier and more natural to deal with with something like a, a controller instead of a keyboard and mouse. Now, what you might also notice that I just noticed is that my X is actually going backwards. So where I might think that going to the left is going to make me look to the left, it's actually making me look to the right here. So I'm going to go ahead and add another math chop just to flip this channel's inputs around. Now this is super easy to do and you might be thinking to yourself, we're using a lot of math chops today. And that's because they're just so flexible and they're so useful in chop processing. So I know that my X rotation here, I said, I just want to flip that around. So what I could do is right click on this output, add another math chop. And in this case, I'm going to go to the range page. And I know that my range right now is from negative one to positive one. So I'm going to make my from range negative one to positive one. And now that I know if I want to flip that range, that means my two range is going to be one to negative one. So now if I go ahead and reset my position, making my second stick go to the left makes me look left, second stick to the right. And now I can totally take over and control this scene with the stick. Now there are many different ways you could build this camera because for example, I used a more panning centric left stick. Uh, if you've played FPS games or any kind of other first person games, you might be more used to the up and down of the left stick moving you forward and back through space. Honestly, not a big change from here. You know, if you consider the channels that we have access to, doing a change like that really equates to just taking that Y value that we have and moving it to a Z channel or another different channel from there. So with that said, any of these other buttons on here, if I scroll into my joystick chop, you know, they're all giving me very easy to use values that could be used however you want to use them in your project. So with that said, I hope this is helpful and enjoy.
Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.